What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over macros in our fighting game tutorial series. So macros, for those that aren't familiar, are basically one input or button that can relate to other inputs and buttons. So it's essentially a binding. Now, it could be as simple as a one button binding. You could press a button that relates to another button. Sometimes this is useful because the buttons may be hard to press at the same time where your hands are on the controller or the keyboard. But a lot of times a macro will be multiple buttons. So for example, I can have a macro that performs the throw for me. The throw is a multi-button input. If I try to perform the throw, I may run into some trouble. I could get it correct like that and that and that. And actually I'm getting it pretty accurately, but see how I missed it right there. Even though I was trying to perform the throw, I performed just a regular heavy attack. So a macro cuts out that that potential user error where I press one button and I know that it's bound to the light and the heavy attack. So in this case, it is going to perform the throw because I'm pressing one button and there is no room for user error. I can perform the throw accurately as many times as I want in a row. There are a lot of people who don't like macros because it takes out the human error component and sometimes they're even considered cheating. So it depends on if you want these in your game or not. You could very easily avoid macros, but it can still be used for different bindings. That's what we're going to be covering today. Any of our multi-button inputs like this, like the X light attack, could work with a macro very easily. And some games I see that has even three buttons or more, you can have as many buttons as you want tied to a macro. So macros are pretty cool and pretty useful. Before we get started, I just want to give a huge thank you and shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. I really appreciate all you guys have done for this series, for my channel, for everything. I'm just glad you guys are so excited about watching this and following along. And I'm happy to make these videos week after week. So glad you're enjoying them. And like I said, thank you very much. All right, with that said, we can go ahead and get into the episode. So before we go over the logic, if you'd like to get caught up to everything that we've done, I'll leave this playlist right here in the top right corner. You can check out every single episode we have in the fighting game tutorial series. This is episode 152, so we're pretty far along. We still have a long way to go, but we've done a lot, and if you want to get caught up, you can check out everything we've done in there. Alternatively, you can go ahead and click this episode right here if you want to go over multi-button inputs. This is essentially what the macro is making easier by binding it to a, a singular button. However, we still will want the multi-button input behavior in the game to get this to trigger properly. So I'll link you to the first episode of that little mini series within this series right now if you just want to get that part set up to then watch this macro episode. Okay, and with all that said, we can go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're going to do is in the code. So I'm going to go to my code and I'm going to go to my fighter template character dot H. I'm going to scroll down to where my E input type enum is. Now, typically this isn't commented out because we use our E input type all the time. We use it for all of our command list inputs. We use it for our input buffer. We use it for a ton of stuff. However, I'm going to move it to the game instance, which sounds funny because you're like, well, why would you move this, right? This is what the characters can do. But there's a few things that we need to consider. Remember how we move the menu controls or potential menu controls to the controllers, those code classes? Sometimes we want to be able to perform actions off the controllers and not if a character is in the scene or not. This is a similar case here. We may want to bind a macro to certain inputs regardless if there's a character spawn. Like you could bind a macro on the main menu in the options menu. Well, we don't want to spawn a character set this and then try and track the data. Instead, we should just set in the game instance or some sort of player profile that we can read from to then use that data when the game is playing. In this case, the game instance is perfect, especially since this is a local game right now. You'll remember many, many episodes back, we did a widget where we could modify what buttons performed what actions. Now we still have to fully implement this into our game, but you'll be seeing that again really soon. And so thinking ahead to when we're going to use that, we are going to need this outside the character. So you can delete it, but what I would recommend is copying it from the character class, commenting it out, going over to your base game instance.h where your enums are. This is the top of my file. I put it as the last enum in the list. And I just pasted it here. So I didn't change anything about this enum. I just changed where it was. Now you'll notice that the fighter template character.h includes the base game instance.h, 
So you don't have to do anything additional to any of the other variables or arrays that we have that use this type. It's just going to work regardless because it's including the class that it is now in. Okay, but you can't have two enums of the same name in two different classes. So you definitely have to comment this one out or flat out get rid of it, which is what we're going to do. I'm going to get rid of the one in fire template character. Just leave the one in base game instance. So we are all good. There's no stress, nothing to worry about. We're just moving that because we're going to need to make a variable or, a or several variables to track what these macros are bound to. And the best way to do that is in something outside of the character so we can do it on menus where characters don't exist. Now let's go into the base game instance.h. Here's our enum that we just moved over. Let's scroll down and go down to the variables. Now, I've made a new variable in the base game instance.h. And this, are, this is going to be the inputs that are bound to this macro, right? So if I press this button, what inputs get placed into the input buffer, right? What, which inputs are used when I press this button? So I've made it U property, edit anywhere, blueprint, read, write, although it's not really required that we do that right now. I did put it here for now in case we want to do anything with it in the blueprints. It is going to be used when we are going over that widget that I was telling you about that we set up where we can manually bind buttons to specific actions in the game. So that's where it's really going to be helpful for it to be blueprint read write. Now, right now, I'm only doing it for player one. We are going to have another macros episode, and I'll add player two at that point. But if you want to add player two now, you can. It's super simple. You're just going to take this variable and rename it to be player two macro inputs. So basically, this is going to be a T array of our enum. So an array of all of the inputs that we want this macro to run. Okay, so T array of E input type. That is this enum that we just moved over. Then we want to rename it to be something that makes sense for the situation. So we're going to call it P1 macro inputs in this case. And this is because this is the first macro that I have, but we do have to know what the, the inputs are bound to, right? So if we have this macro and it's bound to light and medium, we need to know that ahead of time. And this is specifically player one. Player two might have different macro inputs. As an example, we can go ahead and make one now. Since we're not using the widget to actually bind this macro right now, we're just going to make sure we can get the, the macro logic working. As the macro can be bound to anything the user wants, so we can't possibly predict that. But we can just get it working for every input. And thus, when they can change it, then we won't have to worry about it. It works for any array of inputs, any, any amount of inputs. If we go to our base game instance.cpp and go to the constructor where we set all of our variables, we're just going to set this up like any other variable. Uh, for an array, we have to set the number of elements that we want to use. We can continuously add to it, but we need at least a minimum. So the minimum would be one in case you want to just bind another action. If you want to bind this button to do this action, and that's fine. I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated and give it two inputs. That way we can really show off the power of the macro in this case. So I'm just going to grab our array, call set num on it, and pass it to. So it's got two elements in the array. Then also in the constructor, I want to fill out each element as a default. Again, this will be easily changeable by the user. But since we don't have that right now and we're just testing the actual macro functionality, we can give it whatever values we want. I recommend giving it values that actually relate to a multi input command that you have in your game. This will allow you to actually test and see if you perform the command. If you perform the command when you press the button for the macro, you know it's working because it's put in both the inputs that you'd expect to perform that command. So I take each index P1 macro inputs zero and give it a light attack because that is my first input type required for my throw command. And then P1 macro inputs one and give it a type of heavy attack because that is my second input type required to perform backward throw. And those are the only inputs that I need to perform that command. So theoretically, this already is good enough to be able to perform a command if this macro is pressed. But we need a way to relate the data in this macro to what gets put into our input buffer. 
if we go into our base player controller.h, this is where we're going to capture the input for the macro. And then we're going to send that data to the character like we would any other input. So like I said, base player controller.h, scroll down to where wherever you want, but this is gonna be another type of press and release. So we probably wanna put it with the other press and release inputs. So I put it right under call start attack and call release attack. And I call the function call press macro one and call release macro one. Calling them macro one here because you could have multiple macros. A lot of games have a certain amount that you could have. So you may have one macro, two macros. I've seen games have up to 12 macros. So you could have as many custom macros as you want here. And so we wanna make sure that we support all those. For how many we're gonna have, we need to keep track of which ones they are bound to. In this case, we're only doing one, but you can use the same procedure to set up as many as you like. So I'm gonna have one right now. I did make them both blueprint callable, but again, not necessary right now. We will do more with this in the second macro episode, and this could very well become necessary because we're, we'll be going over the keyboard mode and controller logic to bind the macros. And so you'll see why that comes in handy then, but for now, I'm just setting it up so that they are blueprint callable. That way we don't have to come modify them later. All right, now we can go to base player controller.cpp. We want to scroll down to setup input component. Setup input component is where we bind all of our inputs that are pressed to the functions that they should call. So we're going to need to make an action mapping to pick up on this macro. So let's go into the editor before we continue in the code. Go to edit, project settings, scroll down to input. And I have all my other ones closed here, except for my macro one. So I've made a new action mapping by pressing the plus here, renamed it to macro one, and I've given it a default key for now, which is the three key on the keyboard. And I'm good to go. I know that I'm looking for macro one. Okay. So if I go into the code, you can go anywhere in here. Doesn't matter. But... I put it again next to my start and release attacks because I consider it pretty much the same as those. So for organizational reasons, I keep it close. I'm gonna bind two actions. I'm gonna bind both the press and the release because your macro may have press inputs like, oh, I'm pressing light, I'm pressing heavy, like in this case. However, if you have attacks that trigger on release of an input, we need them to also function the same even if we're using the macro. So when we release the button used for the macro, it has to call a separate event. So I have input component bind action, macro one, right? Macro one is this right here. So you can copy it or manually type it in, but that's what we have in the string here. Pressed this class, the controller, and call press macro one. Essentially what we're saying is, when the input bound to this action mapping is pressed, we're gonna go to this object reference and call this function. This function is the function we just made in the header file of the base player controller. Right here. Right, and then we're gonna do the same thing but for released. So we're gonna bind action, macro one, released this object reference, call release macro one. Now we have our bindings. So when we press this button, the controller should call this function. We need to, of course, go and set these functions up. So scroll down. Again, I put them in the same spot, so it's all easy to get to in an organizational sense, right? So under my call release attack four, I made two new functions, call press macro one, call release macro one. Super simple logic, pretty much the same that we've been doing it the entire time throughout our controller. We only want to do any logic with this macro if we're already in the game. So we need to see if our possessed pawn is true. And again, all this has been covered in previous episodes of the controller. But if we do have a pawn that we're possessing, we want to go to the pawn and call a press macro one function. This is if it's the call press macro one. If it's the release, we want to call release macro one. So we check if there's a pawn. If there is a pawn, we go to the pawn and call release macro one. Now you probably don't have either of these functions yet because of course we have to go set them up. 
So you can pause here for a second and go to your fighter template character or your base character.h. If we scroll down, and again, keeping it consistent, I put it next to my attacks. So I made two new functions here, press macro one, release macro one. Right now they're not blueprint callable or anything, they're just functions in the code. So once you make these two functions here, press macro one, release macro one, you can go into the fighter template character CPP, scroll down to where you'd like to place them. Mine are pretty far down the list, all the way here. So I've made two functions, press macro one, release macro one. So make sure you fill them out. Once you add them here, before we get into the logic inside of each of these functions, just once you, you put in the header and the brackets, we can go in to the base player controller .cpp and make sure you call these functions. You don't want to forget this step. So let's not go too far before we do it. Make sure your base player controller is calling these functions on our characters. All right, now once it is doing that, we can go ahead and fill out the logic in press macro one and release macro one. So these macros, we have to treat them like regular inputs because we want to do the same logic that they would if the player truly pressed them. So we need to grab what the macros are bound to for the correct player. Right now, we're only doing this for player one. So this is only going to use the player one macro input. In the next episode, we're going to incorporate player two. We're not worried about that now, so we're keeping it simple. But to grab the inputs that the macro is bound to, it is now... We have to grab the game instance to do this because it is hidden within that class. Okay, so if auto game instance, we're making a variable called game instance, and we're casting the game instance function, Unreal's function, to our specific game instance type, U base game instance. Assuming this cast succeeds, and it should, if it doesn't, there's a problem, but if it succeeds, then we can grab the data from it. So what we want to do is loop through all the elements within the P1 macro inputs array and perform input logic on them. As a refresher, perform input logic is what we call whenever we press any button or release any button with the type press release. Right, so when we press this button, this is how we know to add it to the input buffer and a bunch of other stuff really. And we just want to copy that type of behavior but for each button or each input that this macro represents. So we do a basic for loop, integer i equals zero, i is less than game instance arrow p1 macro inputs dot num. So for all the elements in this array, increment i. Then we're gonna perform input logic, but instead of passing it a manual value, like in our other examples, again, using star attack four, we pass that e input type E special attack. Instead of doing that, we're just going to take game instance p macro inputs index i. We do know this is a press, however, so we can manually hard code e input status e press, and that will always be accurate. Now, there's something else I have commented out here. For our practice mode and our input stack, we do need to display this icon on the screen. We don't actually have the ability to do that right now because the way we've done this before is through a hard coded value in each function. That was fine before. However, this is a case that can be modified to represent multiple values. So it won't actually work by giving it a hard coded value here. This is something else we will cover in the next macro episode. We are going to bind those images to specific actions. So we can still call them from certain places. But what we'll be able to do is actually grab what images belong to these inputs that are in this T array of of inputs bound to the macro and then we'll display them to the screen so i've left this here as an example but i've kept it commented out because right now it won't display the proper input to the input stack in training mode or practice mode now for release it's even easier because it's essentially the exact same thing you can copy it and paste it into your release we don't need the input stack at that point so you can remove the comment and code. And the only thing we're changing here is in perform input logic, we're going to use e input status release instead of press. And the short version of this is this is going to go into the blueprint, you know, display everything related to 
what it is that we pressed, return the actual value that we want to add, add it to the input buffer, and then the input buffer is going to go like it normally does and check to see if we've done a command. Since we know that light and heavy is a throw, it is going to go in and it's going to perform the throw action. Now, this is looking pretty good. There are actually a few things that we should set up in our check input buffer for command using type function. So within this function, we have a lot going on. So I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. There's actually two bugs within this function that can both be eliminated, and they were only present during times of trying to use multi-input commands, specifically trying to use multi-input commands during the same frame. They made it more complicated and also more prevalent, so you'd see them more often, but it was more confusing to debug than if they were on different frames, so I really started seeing them during this macro. So we're going to fix both of them right here. If we scroll down... And we have our main if statement here where we check if correct sequence counter is greater than negative one, right? We check this to make sure we haven't already found a command in the search that we are doing. And then we go through and we check certain things like if the type matches or if it's a multi-input command, if the status matches or it's a press and the status is hold, and if the charge frames are greater than the required charge frames. We have an else if to make sure that we're not releasing an input and that that should be tracked. And then we have another else if to see is input in multi input command and the status is equal to release. And what we're trying to do here is if we're holding one or more inputs that are in a multi input command, such as the throw. So say I'm holding my light attack and I release my light attack, but I never press the heavy. Well, we want to reset the light attack to not being currently held, right? We don't want to press light attack, release it, then press heavy and still perform the throw. That's not what we want. They should be pressed at the same time or at least held at the same time. They don't have to be pressed on the same frame or anything, but they both have to be held down. We don't want to release one and still trigger it. In this for loop, I was using index I. However, I've already used index I up above here. Okay, I know this is a complicated function. There's a lot going on here, but I've already used index i. And so I don't want to recreate index i here and use it in all of these spots like I was. So instead, we want to use a different variable, and we're going to use something like j. This is very important because we do want to reset the loop and go through all of the values in this loop. And we're not trying to reset this i either. We don't want to change the values that are in here. Okay, so we have to make sure we're not using I. We want to use something else. I use J. Okay, so J, 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 and also J and J. Make sure you make those five changes to I's within these lines of code. Once you've done that, there's one other thing that we should fix up, and that is within our is input and multi input command function. So in this function, we recently updated it to where we would check these specific inputs to see if they were being held and then return a value, such as true or false, to determine if the user was pressing them and they can actually go forward with the command they're trying to perform, such as backward throw. However, we don't want to return false if the input is found, but it's already held. In the case of the macro, you can really see why it screws things up because if I press one button and it's meant to work for light attack and heavy attack, I'm not currently pressing both of those inputs. And so is currently held would be set to true for one of them, such as the light attack and never reset to false because it's like, well, you didn't release it because I never released the light attack button. That is because we were, this if statement here was not being read correctly, and thus we couldn't return true, which means we were always returning false, which means we could not get into this else if that we just fixed up a lot of the time. So we were never resetting that value, it was always being considered held. I was doing this to avoid setting a value to something that is already set to, however, considering it caused a bug, and it doesn't really hurt anything to set the value back to itself, when the real important thing is returning true. I'm just get, getting rid of that second 
if statement in there. And I am using this logic now for is input and multi input command. Then that will make sure that return true can be accessed in more cases, which will allow it to work for macros as well. And we will be able to reset this value properly when releasing the macro. We go back into the editor. We can now test it out. So we can load up our game. Okay. And again, I can use my regular attacks. Okay. I can use my light attack. I can use my medium. I can use my heavy. I can use commands such as fireball or chargeable commands such as the homing thunderball. I can press and release my heavy attack right away. So I can do everything that I'm used to doing, right? So nothing ru got ruined with our input buffer. Then I can also press my new key, my macro key, to perform the throw, because right now it's bound to light and heavy attack. Now I have light and medium bound to my X light attack that looks like this, okay? So for that, if I wanted to, right now it's set up in the code, but I can go into the base game instance.cpp and change macro inputs index one to e medium attack okay now if i launch this i'll meet you back when the editor is open i can start up the game i can go into my level skip my stage intros and character entrances and i can perform the macro i can press the macro and i can perform the x light attack now so I can perform it with perfect precision because every time I press this macro, it will fire. Right? And so I can easily rebind this macro. And you can see as a player why I could rebind it in a menu and then get different moves that I could use. Because now if I want to perform the throw, I'm going to have to perform light and heavy. And with that said, we are good to go. There's one more thing I want to show you, something we're going to cover in the next episode. So if we open up practice mode instead, load this, this up right here now you see if i if i perform light and heavy i can do x light attack right okay however if i am to perform the macro i perform the attack but nothing gets added to the input stack that is exactly what i'm talking about that is what we'll be fixing in the next episode as well as setting up player two although you can set up player two's macros right now it's actually very simple to do and it won't be hard but i'll go over it anyway just to show you so that we're all on the same page so anyway, guys, that's all I got for you. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please subscribe. There's more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. And I just really appreciate it. I want to give another shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon supporters and subscribers. Thank you guys for everything. I am so incredibly excited to get these episodes out to you every single week. And I just want to thank you. Continuously thank you for your amazing support. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, I'd be happy to get you sorted. If you want, just contact me in the Discord community linked in the description. I'd be happy to help you and get you moving on your game again. Anyway, guys, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.